everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. I am super excited to be joined today by Jenny Gilder, who is the CEO and founder of the Gilder Office for Growth, co-owner of the WNBA Seattle Storm, two-time All-Ivy rowing champ, Olympic silver medalist, also an author. Uh, so excited to have you on the podcast, Jenny. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited to chat a little bit more. We've we've done like a, a pre-chat thing and, and I'm really excited to dive into maybe a different take on sports um, that, that we've had before. But real quick, would you mind giving folks a little bit of background on um, maybe after having, you know, play or road in college, been on the national team, how you maybe transitioned into the business side of sports? Well, sure, but it was totally serendipitous. There was no planning involved. It really had to do with the fact that in 2007, the new owner of the Sonics and the Storm was a guy named Clay Bennett, who decided to move both franchises to Oklahoma City. And he was doing that because the city, county, state, um, Seattle, King County, Washington, were unwilling to use taxpayer funds to update Key Arena. So he, he, and I think that Clay probably had bought the team knowing that he wanted to move it to Oklahoma City. But um, there were, there's a small group of women who decided they wanted to try to keep the storm here. And I knew the woman who was leading that um, attempt. And I got interested because I've always been an advocate for access to opportunity. And I thought, well, there's no professional rowing so maybe if I got involved with women's sports on the business side, I could try to make an impact. That's incredible. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And I mean, obviously one of the most exciting franchises in the WNBA um, have had tremendous su- success. Um, but something that we talked about that, yeah, we wanted to focus on today was what happens when you don't have success in athletics? Um, what's it like on the flip side and, and how that might fuel people more than winning does. So, yeah, I know that, um, there've been a couple things, maybe one of the, the biggest was the 1980 Olympics. You make the Olympic team for rowing and the U S decides to boycott those Olympic games in Moscow. What was that process like of, you know, you're training, you're, you're in the best shape probably of your life and then you can't go. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, one step before that, Ashley, was that I had started trying out for national teams in 1977. I had been rowing for the grand total of a year. But there were two women on my crew my freshman year who made the U.S. Olympic team, Ann Warner and Chris Ernst. And uh Chris was a spare, Annie won a bronze medal in the women's eight. And I was like, oh my gosh, if if they can do it, I can do it. I mean, talk about total naivete, but that is really true, right? We talk about it all the time today, see it, do it. Um, so I tried out 1977, 1978, 1979, and got cut three years in a row. And that was just excruciating because I really had probably a little bit too much of my identity wrapped up in being successful. And every time I didn't make it, I really felt like a failure as a human being. So, and I was very young. I I mean, I was, I didn't turn 20 until 1978. So, and it wasn't like my family knew about sports. It wasn't like there was the kind of infrastructure that you have to support young athletes today. I was really on my own. And my own college coach didn't think I would make the Olympic team. He told me when I told him I wanted to train, you'll never be good enough, you're too small. Yeah, it was really pretty rough. So all I wanted (laughs) when I was trying out for the 1980 Olympic team was to make the team. Like that was all I was thinking about. And then in the middle of February of 1980, I remember we were running stairs. I was at the Yale um, gym and we were running stairs and I was running with my teammate, Sally Fisher. And so February 15th was the day that the boycott became official. And Sally and I were like, okay, what are we doing? We're running stairs. And I said, I, we got down to, you know, the turnaround point for the next set. And I said, why are we doing this? You know, we're, we can't go to the Olympics. And she said, I don't know, but we're not done yet. And she turned around and started running. So I had to chase her back up. But for me, the whole tryout was about, could I finally kind of break through and make the team? And that was, um, 
you know, obviously an incredibly satisfying experience when I saw my name on the list. But until then, I didn't really let myself think about not getting to go to the Olympics because I figured I wasn't going to get to go anyway. And then once I didn't, I made the team, but we didn't get to go, I was part of a larger group that got to kind of be upset together, grieve together, and uh, integrate the experience together. So it wasn't such a lonely feeling. Oh, that's that, beautiful. You know, um, and it was hard, but I'm always, you know, I've always been very proud of the fact that it was the rowers who really stood up against the president. It was Anita de France, who was a rower. You know, she had just finished law school at the time. She's on the, you know, she's been on the IOC for years. Um, who really challenged President Carter and tried to get the IOC to let the Americans compete under the Olympic flag. And she, you know, really fought for us. And so the rowing team ended up being this source of, you know, grit and like never say die that kind of bolstered me through the personal loss of not getting to compete. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible to have such a, a team experience around that that would be fueling to the fire. And I think what's really cool is we've seen, we see that a lot, especially in women's sports. We see a lot of unity around movements, um, social movements, getting something done, um, which is really cool, which we'll talk about in a second. So, but real quick, because 1980, yeah. So the boycott happened, but then 84 it's in LA, you go and you win. Yeah. So what were the, the whole emotional roller coaster? I'm sure of 1980 and you're fighting for something. And then boom, it's here again. You have to make the team again. What was that like? Well, first of all, my father had leaned on me really hard to quit rowing. He's like, okay, it's okay. You did it in college. So I, I told him I was quitting before the 1980 Olympics, basically lied and then got a job and he couldn't do anything about it. And he was kind of, yeah, okay. You're not asking for anything. So I guess you're going to do what you're going to do. But I then did say I was quitting after 1980. And I remember saying goodbye to the head rowing coach um in Europe and he's like uh you know so what are you doing I said oh I'm retiring and he goes oh and he's he's a Polish guy he's a very thick accent he goes oh Ginny you have so much potential and it was literally the first time a coach had ever been positive wow. so I took that forward and decided that I would switch from sweep rowing to sculling so I could get a full-time job and I could row by myself and train and that was what happened. So I made the team in 1982. I uh, was in the women's squad. In 1983, I actually was a single for the U.S. and won a bronze medal. Lost to an East German and a Soviet. Um, we don't have to talk about uh, performance-enhancing drugs. Uh, uh. And then in 1984, I was the favorite to win the single trials, the singles trials, and represent the U.S. in the single. And I broke my rib over training ten days before the Olympic trials. Oh my gosh! So I was lucky to make the team. I ended up stroking the women's quad, and so the whole thing was, as usual, not a straight line. Um, incredibly gratifying, uh, really fun, and um, made me, I think, really just appreciate, um, you know, I think the thing I know about myself best is when the chips are down, I will go through a period of being extremely upset and unhappy with myself. But at a certain point, it's like, okay, now what? What are we going to do here? And that definitely, that quality has developed really because of all the failures I had, right? All the instances of people saying no. And I think what I got more than anything was, it really doesn't matter if nobody else believes in you, you got to believe in you. And you kind of got to find your peeps. You got to find the people who are going to believe in you because it's not really enough for you to be on your own. It's it's exhausting. So that yeah. was how it was. Well, and I can't, I'm sorry, what? I mean, I loved being on the Olympic team and being in LA, it was great. Yeah. Well, and I mean, so much of what you just said is so important. It, I, it's, it's hard to hear you say that it had been so long that you hadn't had a positive remark from a coach. I just feel like that's, ah, I, there's such a, a beauty in coaching and having a positive attitude and building people up. It's hard to hear when people take the, the alternative approach. Um, 
but there is something to be said about learning how to fail. What do you think? I mean, do you think that's important for athletes to go through an experience like that and, and learn some of those things like you just mentioned? Well, first of all, I think most of us lose more than we win. So you, and, and that's not just true in sports. That's just true in life. You don't usually get what you want. Yeah. Now, whether you categorize that as a win or a loss, it kind of doesn't matter. You still have to adjust to the gap between the expectation you had and the reality that you get, right? That's the, in that gap is where disappointment lives. So this is really all about how do you deal with disappointment? Um, and my coach said to me, I remember my freshman year, we, uh, the big race at the end of the year was the Eastern sprints and we, we lost. And we had won pretty much everything up until that point. And I was like, oh, I was so upset. And he said, look, you lose more, you learn more when you lose. And I, you know, I was, I was not even 18 yet. I'm like, ah, I'd rather be stupid. But the truth is you do learn more when you lose because when you win, you just did everything right, right? The proof is in the trophy you've got. When you lose, clearly something didn't go right. So that's when you have a chance to take a step back reflect on what happened, reflect on where there might be a gap. Now, not everybody does this. Some people say, screw it, I'm over, or they blame, some, they, they don't look at what happened and what their role might have been in falling short. They just blame somebody. Or they give up because it's not important enough anymore, which by the way, is totally valid, right? We, you know, we, we're always adjusting to, is this still as important as it once was? And that's a very important <laughs> Uh, internal dialogue to have when you hit a milestone, whether it's a failure milestone or a success milestone. But really being able to look, look, you know, kind of inside and think about, hmm, where did I fall short? Um, and then, of course, as soon as you can do that, and not then start digging at yourself, like, oh, you're an idiot, or da 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 da, but you know, kind of try to look at it a little more clinically and say, well, what could I do differently next time? How could I address that problem? And you know, really, if I had understood in 1976 and 1977 how important mental toughness was, and and having like a group of people who supported and believed in me. If I had known that, I would have been able to address that. I had no idea how different it was to be on my college team where I had the support of my crew and be fighting for a seat in a crew where I didn't really know anybody and didn't have anybody rooting for me. So I figured that out retrospectively. Hmm. But if I hadn't, if I had had that insight then, who knows? Maybe I would have made the team before three years, you know? Yeah. I mean, hindsight, like you said, hindsight 2020, yeah. I see a lot, a lot in hindsight, but yeah, I mean, it, I think it is, it's something that I hope is getting better sports psychology and just like that mental part of sports is so important. And I think that it's getting more of the conversation these days, um, which is great, but there, cause there is so much to learn about yeah, losing or, you know, I was talking to someone earlier on a podcast and they were talking about how in basketball, it's like, you don't know if you miss a shot, you don't have time to like sit there and like, you know, wallow in it. You have to keep going. The play is still going. Um, but then at the end of the game, yeah, take a look at the tape, see what you can do. It's, it's not, it's not so much self critiquing. It's becoming aware of where you can improve. That's right. And believing that you can, that you can improve, right. Instead of oh no, the way it is, that's just the way it is. But I also think people don't think enough about how important kind of psycho-emotional preparation is and um, really getting yourself to a place of being excited about what's ahead, but not terrified, right? And understanding like why you love doing this and not getting too caught up in how important it is to like win or whatever. Like that, there is a delicate balance there that not a lot of us usually have a grip on. Oh, that those are such wise words. Yeah, that's uh, that's really good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, and you know, you've talked about you personally trying to make teams and then the national team. I'm curious how this also plays into a community. So Seattle storm, we were talking, you know, earlier and just had a really painful end to the season. How do you see it trickle down? Not just the organ, like the team, but the organization, the rest of the staff, and then the city. Um, do you see it as a, like a bigger microcosm there? Well, it's interesting. First of all, 
the people who took the loss the hardest were the people who are closest, like for the team, right? And yeah. coaches. And then the um, certainly the ownership group and the people who work in our organization. But as you start to get a little further out, what you hear is it was an amazing season. It was really fun. The games were great. Oh my gosh, playing at Climate Pledge Arena, what amazing energy. And then, you know, at the city level, they love what the storm is all about. You know, um, we really, and it's true for every WNBA franchise and certainly in a place like Seattle, we authentically are about generating social change. WNBA would not exist without Title IX and the push for women's sports as well as amateur and professional sports to get the attention and the investment that that they deserve you know it's it's not like it's ongoing mm. hopefully it's building some momentum so you know that's the part that always catches me off guard is how uh, the storm is yeah i might be an owner of the team but it's really the com a, a gem of the community mm. you know it's we are more the uh the people who are holding it right now for however long we get to. And then at some point we will pass this on to the next owners to take care of this very precious asset of the cities. And when I remember that, I can kind of step a little away from the pain of losing and just uh, really absorb the experience of a young girl or boy watching you know, the team and how excited they get and how much they love meeting Stewie or Jewel and of course Sue, although she's retired. And also how people in the city talk about the team, you know, really positively. It makes yeah. an impact on people. So that's very gratifying. That's awesome. That's incredible. And it's, you know, I've never lived in a city that had a women's like professional basketball team. Um, I'm heading out to LA where there is one and I'm excited to, yeah, hear the murmurs. You know, I, it is my dream always to be in a sports bar and overhear someone talking about women's sports. Um, and so I love to hear that. Yeah. There's, there is a, a murmur about the town of Seattle, um, all about the storm, uh, as, as there should be, because it's an incredible organization and team. So that's really cool. Well, and it's, you know, you mentioned title nine, um, you know, you've been a part of social change too, right? Your team was involved in and activism um, back at Yale, um, and it's still ongoing. What do you think is it about female athletes or, um, yeah, women's sports that kind of drives that that need to see a bigger picture and make bigger change? Um, because of the status quo, uh, <laughs> because there, you know, we're still uh, the culture has shifted a lot in fifty years. There's no question, but there is still this bias against women in sports. That's why, you know, it's a ridiculously low percentage of media coverage devoted to sports is devoted to women's coverage. Same thing with corporate sponsorships of sports franchises. All, almost like over 95% is focused on men. So, I mean, it, obviously the push for equity isn't just about female athletes. It's across the globe. You know, you can divide it, gender, sexuality, race. It's, I think, part of the human story. And it's kind of a, I don't know if it's a cool part of being American, I don't, um, but at least while, you know, we in this country have, you know, a history that certainly has its sordid parts, we also make room for the possibility of change. Hmm. And what I love about women athletes, especially more and more, I love this about the WNBA athletes is there is a growing attitude of, of course I deserve the same thing. You know, why wouldn't I? That, that was not the case when I was 17, 18. You know, we fought for stuff and believed it intellectually, but emotionally I had grown up in a world where I didn't expect that I should be treated the same. More and more young women and girls are growing up expecting that they should get a fair shake. And when they run into that, they're like, what? What is wrong with you? Instead of what's wrong with me hmm. for wanting this. And I think certainly women's sports is on the vanguard of, of helping shift that attitude. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
certainly hear this, that it, it, that has to be a trickle down effect from uh, people like you who came before and fought for, you know, this, the status quo, even of the idea of what a woman should think she's due to change. So, you know, what you're hearing now is probably a direct correlation to all the folks that have come before and said, no, no, this is, this should be the new normal. Absolutely. This is not something that one person wakes up one day and decides. Yeah. This is, you know, how do you shift a culture? It does. It takes a long time and it takes all those people, men as well as women, who have done incremental steps to, to help people start looking at the, at the world differently. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what does make you excited? Um, not just that and that mentality now of young female athletes, but what about women's sports, uh, has you really excited for, you know, the next five years, I guess. Well, you know, I'm a business owner. Uh, we, our goal when we bought this, the storm was to be able to sell it one day, not as a like cheap little trinket, but as a valuable franchise, because, that's when you can sell something, it has a future. It's, it's a business, not a hobby. So we've been all about building our business. And one of the things that we've embarked on is building the Center for Basketball Performance in Seattle, which is the first practice facility built and designed by women for women. Wow. Uh, probably in the world. It's a $65 million project. We put in a bunch of our own money you know, we just got our loan and just putting this whole project together has been, well, it has its moments of being terrifying, <laughs> but it's also really exciting and really fun. And again, uh, you know, we take our business seriously. And, you know, 15 years ago when we bought the business, we took ourselves seriously, but the city didn't quite, you know, mm -hmm. corporate partners didn't quite. We've seen a huge amount of change and been part of that change. And now getting to build something that's literally going to be where business, sports, and social change live, like that's the intersection, that's like really, really fun. And to see how you know the city's planning department has come together and how our contractors have redone how they hire subs because we care about women in BIPOC representation who's building and designing the facility. It's been amazing to realize how how we work actually has a trickle down effect across all kinds of industries. Hmm. So for me, you know, sports is kind of it. I am a jock. I still do sports. I can't help myself. But just continuing to try to build the storm's presence in the city and build the WNBA's presence so that there are more franchises out there and more people, more athletes get to play and hmm. more young girls, families, even men and women get to watch and cheer WNBA team. I mean, that's for me, I, that's kind of where I live these days. I love it. I love that so much. Is there a place folks can tune in to see the progress of that project? You know, we haven't posted much on it yet. You can probably check out the storm website, but I don't know that we have much on it. We just got our master use permit last week. We're, sure. we're you know, hoping to break ground in the first quarter of next year. So you're going to you have to, sniff around the web, storm website. I, I'm going to, it's a good point. I should probably make sure that we got something there. Yeah. Well, we'll, uh, we'll follow up too. And, and anything that we do see, we'll reshare because that, like you said, that's incredibly exciting and it's just so neat, um, to still be in the age of landmark things happening. Um, yeah. you know, not everything's been done for the first time yet. So you're doing something yeah. for the first time. It's really exciting. So congrats yeah. on your permit Thanks. and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have a time for a couple quick rapid fire questions and then we'll tell sure. folks how to connect? Sure. Let's see what you said. What you got? All right. So uh, favorite sports movie ever. Oh my gosh. You know, it's probably Chariots of Fire. Oh. It's just because it made me cry so much. It's a good one. That's a really good one. If you could be an Olympian in any other sport other than rowing, what would you want to go for um and I, you promise i wouldn't get injured yes um i think i might skiing downhill skiing nice that's a good one that's really good that's they go so fast it is yeah, quite exactly. thrilling to watch yeah. yeah who was your favorite athlete when you were growing up who inspired you you know um martina 
Navra Talova, even though she has some points of view about trans athletes that I might not agree with, um, I've always I always really admired her as an athlete and as a groundbreaker. I mean, she yeah. she took on the world at a time when being gay was not cool, and also she transformed how tennis is played. Yeah, yeah. And who now? Who are, is inspiring you now? Oh, uh, you know, a lot of, um, so I'm a, um, uh, Alicia Gray of, uh, I hate to say it, of the Aces, uh, you know, she's just, uh, was really impressive. I had a lot of respect for her. Uh, I can't help but name Stewie, you know, I love Stewie to me, um, I was in the closet in my 20s and I decided I had to be straight in my 20s and watching her and her wife, hmm. you know, um, in their 20s, get to create the family they want, get to be married, you know, and then she performs at such a high level and is so dedicated. It just warms my heart way beyond just what sports is about, you know, just really what life is about. And so I, lo I just um, love watching her life and, and what she does on and off the court. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, okay. Last question. If you could get tickets for life, you get free tickets for life for any event. Every time it happens, it could be every four years, like the Olympics or every year, WNBA finals, whatever the case may be. What are you getting free tickets for life for? Oh, I would definitely get tickets to the Olympics every four years. So I could go like a pass where I could go and see any event. Yes. And I would do summer games more than winter, except if I was skiing, then I'd go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. Truly an honor to chat with you. And where can folks follow you or the storm? Um, any links you want to send them to? You know, um, we're really all about the storm these days. Uh, I'm working on another book. My memoir is out there. But, you know, I think really you go to the storm website, you follow us, you'll get the best of what I have to offer these days for sure. Awesome. Well, and we will put a link to course correction, your, your previous book and oh, exciting you. to hear you have another one, but yeah, check all the links in the show notes and just thanks again, Jenny, for your time today. Really thank appreciate you it. Do. And have a great holiday. You too.